Welcome back for episode two here in unit one, Nutrients and Digestion. In this section, which I hope will be a little bit shorter here, but we're going to talk specifically about the nutrients, lipids, and proteins. Uh, lipids will be a little bit shorter, but we got to spend a little bit of time talking about proteins, uh, the most expensive ingredient that you will feed uh, in the ration. So let's first talk about lipids here. Uh, lipids are soluble or insoluble dependent upon what we're mixing them with. Uh, and there's a variety of different fat sources that, that we will utilize at different points in time. And just like we'd already introduced in the carbohydrates section, and you'll see again throughout the course, uh, is we'll start to classify some things. Uh, so first things first, let's look at simple lipids, which are just true fats or waxes that you may use in the ration. Um, then there are compound lipids, which is a lipid uh, tied to something else. So for example, a lipoprotein is a lipid that is attached to a protein, or a glycolipid is a, is a lipid, a fat molecule attached to a sugar molecule. And then you have the LDL, VLDL, and HDL, so low-density lipoproteins, very low-density lipoproteins, and high-density lipoproteins. Those are all uh, fatty acids that are important in animal feeding and nutrition. They're important in human nutrition, um, associated with cholesterol uh, oftentimes. So uh, these are important in feeding because when we talk about feeding lipids, whether they're derived fatty acids, essential fatty acids, um, they're important for feeding because of the energy density that they provide. They are about 2.25 times more energy dense than a carbohydrate. So, and all of us have a, a little bit of a fat requirement here. And the utilization that you will see throughout the course here is as we get to the point where we're building rations, um, you will run out of room in your ration, so to speak. Uh, so basically the animal won't be able to eat anything more, but you'll be short of energy. Uh, you won't have enough carbohydrate in there and they'll need more energy in their ration. So the way to do that is to pull out a little bit of carbohydrate and insert a little bit of fat or lipid into the diet. And that will, uh, just a, a little bit goes a very long way, and that helps them meet their energy requirement need. So uh, for example, in uh, beef cattle or dairy cattle rations, uh, we're probably going to be in that 4 or 5%, 3 to 5% uh, fat range in the diet. And you can't get a whole lot more than that for uh, a number of different reasons that we will talk about in some of our activities in class. Uh, pig diets may get as high as 7% fat. Uh, fat's relatively cheap most of the time and relatively um, palatable as long as you don't get uh, too high in the amount of fat that you're feeding. And then, of course, it, it increases the energy density of the diet. So that's lipids and fat feeding, and we'll talk more about that as we go through the course. Next, let's hit on proteins, and it will be the bulk of this segment here. And actually, we will talk about protein all the time through the rest of the course. Again, it's, it's so important because uh, it isn't, in a, as a per unit basis, the highest priced ingredient that you'll feed. That, that's minerals and vitamins. But in a total amount of cost, uh, protein is the most expensive nutrient that you feed for. Therefore, we have to do it correctly. Uh, we have to feed proteins that are digestible and uh, try and get good buys on them when we can. So protein is the main uh, component of organs and soft tissue structures in the body. Uh, the, the dietary requirement is really, really high in young animals. So what you will see is in young stock rations, protein needs will be pretty high. And as those animals mature and get older, protein dietary needs drop. And we will try and match that drop in the diet uh, as we go along in order to save cost and make sure that they're performing at their highest uh, uh, or optimum uh, productivity. Proteins typically are, are actually quite large molecules. They're bound together by peptide bonds. And the bigger that they are, the more time and energy and heat that they take to break down and digest. So we have to think about a little bit protein structure. So we know that proteins, uh, hopefully that we, you know, that proteins are made up of simple units called amino acids. And if you think about building blocks in a chain, uh, these building blocks are bound together by peptide bonds, and the length of that protein chain, the number of blocks in the chain bound together by that peptide bond string, uh, 
uh, determines the composition of the protein or the type of protein that, they, that there is. There's about 22 amino acids that are commonly found in proteins. And again, they're linked together by these peptide bonds that require an enzyme uh, to break down plus some energy and heat to sever those peptide bonds. So when we look at levels of protein structure, and first on the left we talk about just very simple proteins with what we call primary structure. A couple of amino acids linked together with very simple singular peptide bonds to form that simple polypeptide chain which makes your protein. Uh, don't require a lot of heat or energy to break down. Uh, think about these as like egg proteins. You know, uh, egg or milk proteins are, are very simple primary structure type proteins. Uh, very easy to sever the peptide bonds, therefore really, really digestible. As we move up in um, difficulty or up in complexity, secondary structure is next. And these are twisted polypeptide chains uh, with helical bonds or hydrogen bonds binding them together in helical structure. So if you're following along with what I'm saying here, picture a DNA strand. Uh, DNA strand is like a ladder that's twisted and it has the rungs of the ladder, which is often uh, hydrogen bonds holding the two rails of the ladder together, um, we have to sever those hydrogen bonds plus break the peptide bonds and the amino acid chains linking everything together. Uh, obviously, it takes more energy and more heat to break those down to get to each specific amino acid. It's important that we get to each specific amino acid because that's all that the body can absorb is each individual amino acid. The body cannot absorb a whole um, protein, typically, except for one exception that we will cover here in a second. Tertiary structure is then some of those helical structures that are folded into layers. So imagine uh, three or four DNA-type helical structures that are folded around and then uh, bound together with some other uh, helical structures linked together with additional bonds uh, folded together to make a, a layered type protein full, chuck full of amino acids. Uh, obviously, more complex requires more heat and more energy to break those peptide bonds in order to get to those amino acids that the body actually needs. And then finally, quaternary structure, uh, which is now we're connecting many of those tertiary structures together, which these are very large globular proteins. So picture in your mind uh, antibodies. So we've gone essentially from, uh, you know, if we want to use an analogy, a, a uh, primary structure, size of a marble, very easy to digest, tertiary structure, the size of a ping pong or golf ball, tertiary structure, the size of a softball, quaternary structure, the size of a volleyball, uh, all would be very difficult um, as you go up in size to break down the easiest one to absorb would be that primary structure or that marble. Moving on, so if we talk about, again, kind of give you one more slide on the importance of that structure, the loss of that structure is what we call denaturation. So breaking those peptide bonds is what we call denaturation or denaturing the protein. It's caused by heat. It's caused by the enzyme pepsin. Um, and so as we break those things down, uh, then the body can access and harvest the amino acids that are there. And the easier that that happens, the more digestible the protein is. So one of the processes that we can do in order to process feeds to make them more digestible is heat treating them. So if, um, if you want to think about uh, um, when you open a bag of horse feed or calf grain and you find those kernels of corn that have look like they've been just crimped a little bit, uh, those, that's what we call steam flaked corn. And so what they do is they uh, provide a little steam and heat to it and then run it through a crimper. It flattens the corn kernel out. It heats that corn just enough to the point where the starch is a little bit more digestible. The protein in that corn is more digestible and easier for then that calf or horse that's consuming that feed uh, to break those proteins down in their body and absorb them more optimally. Now, we can have a situation where we can excessively heat it, and that excessive heating is what we call the Maillard reaction, and it actually damages the protein bonds, uh, makes, makes those proteins then very indigestible. So let's assume for a moment that we did not have our crimper set at the proper temperature, and we allowed it to get 
way too hot, it would actually burn the, burn the feed, burn the corn, and the proteins that are in it, then there would be some percentage of that that would be simply undigestible. This happens in times whenever we put up hay at the incorrect moisture, uh, corn silage stored at the incorrect moisture, uh, your pile will overheat uh, or your hay bales will overheat and damage the protein content that is in it. So it's important uh, for a number of reasons, uh, not to mention digestibility and availability of proteins, but also uh, for the quality of the feed. Here's just an additional diagrammatic uh, slide to show you the difference between uh, the four levels of protein structure. Terminology, uh, true proteins are made up only of amino acids, but we will also be utilizing a product and talking about this uh, as we get along in the course of non-protein nitrogen sources. So proteins are made up of nitrogen, and we will calculate uh, protein based upon the amount of nitrogen in it. So non-protein nitrogen, or NPN, is urea. So not a true protein con compound, but your body can use nitrogen and convert it then to protein in the body. So crude protein, uh, which would be most of the time a true protein, we take the amount of measured nitrogen in the feed, we multiply it by a constant of 6.25, and that will give you crude protein content. You can do the same thing for NPN. So for example, urea is 45% nitrogen. If you multiply that times 6.25, Forget about moving, using the decimal point, just 45 times 6.25, you will come up with 282% crude protein. And so we can add a wee bit of urea. It's often found in like lick tubs for beef cattle uh, or found in some of your uh, cattle rations. Just added a little bit of protein. Uh, it's a very cheap source of nitrogen that's able to feed the bacteria in the rumen and easily and cheaply uh, provides protein source for that animal. Digestible por protein then is the portion of crude protein that actually can be digested. Not everything gets digested. Some of it's going to escape via urinary or fecal matter loss. Uh, so that's the difference between fed protein and fecal protein. And then of those 22, uh, 22 amino acids, there are 10 of them that are what we call essential, and they're essential because the animal cannot uh, synthesize or make them quick enough to meet their bodily needs, so we have to sup make sure that they're supplemented. We're learning a lot more about amino acid feeding all the time. Um, you see an acronym there of Private Tim Hall, and then that relates to the 10 essential amino acids that are listed below that. Uh, again, we're learning more and more about amino acid feeding all the time, and it's cutting costs for animal feeding and improving efficiency and productivity um, as we figure out how to implement that. And just in the last uh, 10 years, huge advancements in that, um, in amino acid feeding. Functions of protein, first things first, basic structural units of the body. They help with collagen, keratin, blood proteins. They help with body metabol metabolism, making enzymes, uh, transmitting uh, Gen uh, genetics, they help make hormones, uh, immune antibodies, a number of different things that proteins uh, function for. You will easily see whenever there's a deficiency of protein because growth rates are reduced, feed efficiency is reduced, uh, lack of fertility, fatty livers happen, um, low hormone enzyme production, which is uh, difficult to observe, uh, but you would observe that in in you know, less uh, activity for estrus or things of that nature. Um, deficiencies or imbalances in amino acids sometimes decreases production or limits production. Um, so there's a number of different ways that you can identify protein deficiencies. Almost all protein, all feeds contain some amount of protein. For example, I mentioned corn earlier. Corn is typically 9% crude protein. Uh, almost every bushel of corn that you would come across would be somewhere between eight and a half and 9.2 uh, percent crude protein. Alfalfa hay has a lot of variability depending upon where you cut it. You might be down at uh, 13 or 14 percent crude protein if you had let alfalfa hay go a long time, uh, get past bloom stage uh, to where it gets really woody, uh, it will decrease in protein. Uh, if you 
harvest it early, right at bud stage, it might be 23% crude protein. So there's a lot of variability there. Uh, so it could be quality and quantity uh, protein variability. Digestion and, and metabolism. Uh, again, I mentioned earlier that proteins must be broken down to their individual amino acids in order to be absorbed, except in that postnatal mammal, that, uh, that milk-drinking little baby out there. Uh, is able to, as they're consuming colostrum, colostrum ha can, carries a lot of antibodies, and those antibodies are the biggest quaternary proteins that we uh, will feed them, and they're able to absorb those proteins whole. That's why that's incredibly important that we get them in, get an animals fed colostrum early, is their guts can only absorb those colostrum, those antibodies, uh, for a very short period of time at high efficiency. Every six hours, that ability to absorb those huge protein antibodies drops by about 50%. So once you get past 24 hours, their ability to absorb those huge uh, globular proteins is quite minimal and therefore leads to potential problems with uh, health status of the babies. In the stomach, uh, proteins are broken down to di dipeptides, tripeptides, and then eventually free amino acids. They're absorbed, uh, you know, in the small intestine typically, um, you know, will be broken down in the rumen or the stomach or the abomasum, um, but they're typically absorbed via active transport, uh, which obviously requires some energy in the small intestine, uh, sometimes by the mucosal cells and changed right away to free amino acids. Whole proteins, uh, those huge antibodies are engulfed essentially like grabbed, like the fingers uh, in the small intestine, the, the villi, grab those the mucosal cells and, and happen uh, to be able to pull them right into the mucosal system, right into the blood system and transport them around. So I'm going to stop there um, with episode two. And episode three will bring us uh, minerals and vitamins, and then we'll start transitioning into digestive systems. Thanks for tuning in to this section, Unit 1, Nutrients and Digestion.